And that one, I think. How's that look? What do you guys see on your side? Just a red box? Uh, yes. Perfect. This is what we want to do. So again, uh, thanks a lot for everybody from coming. I'm glad we're recording this because of the little technical difficulty we started off with. Uh, but again, my name is Cody Cox. I am a portfolio manager with uh, Funding Factors as one of my uh, companies here. We're going to have kind of a high level, just a real high level introductory uh, presentation on various ways to invest in notes. Now, first of all, just a little bit about me uh, is, as uh, Bill mentioned in the intro, I'm just a humble mortgage guy from uh, Eastern Oregon. I started off as uh, in Walla Walla, Washington, as, as a loan servicing agent. Uh, when you guys call your 800 number to talk to your mortgage company, uh, I was the guy that answered the phone. Uh, I was there, uh, I handled the cases that ended in 86 all the way up to 99. And so I can still remember that from 1982. Uh, so that kind of dates me. I've been in the mortgage industry for almost 38 years. I'll have my 38th year uh, anniversary sometime here in August. And I don't remember the exact date, but uh, it's coming up here. Uh, and I am based out of the West Coast in Portland, Oregon. I live in a suburb about 20 minutes south of uh, the downtown Portland. Uh, as many of the other downtowns, I don't go there anymore. So uh, things are a little rough in downtown Portland from time to time. Uh, also, I was the previous president, board of directors of Northwest Real Estate Investors Association, uh, and got to know a lot of the speakers uh, that uh, have been around the, the country and uh, learned from them all. Did my own sense of real estate investing at the time, uh, primarily a, uh, a uh, wholesaler, if you will. Uh, but I was listening to a, a note guy that came in that I had come in and I go, you know what, this is what I should be doing. Look at all my background in uh, investing in real estate notes and uh, or, or, or being in the industry in the mortgage industry and so I go you know this really is what I should be doing because this is really what, what I what I'm all about uh, currently I'm the uh, program manager they call it a principal executive program manager for the state of Oregon uh, Oregon is one of those uh, different kind of states that has a home loan program dedicated for their state veterans that is separate and distinct from the federal VA program. We have our own portfolio product. Uh, there's only five other states in the country that have it, uh, Alaska, California, Texas, Oregon, of course, and to a smaller degree, the state of Wisconsin. So anyway, that's fun. And so what I do with that is I manage both sides of that operation. We have a, a servicing portfolio that I manage. It's a, just under 2,000 loans at $375 million worth of loans. Uh, and I manage the origination side of things, which is uh, we're about a 75 to $80 million a year annual in new production. Uh, everything through that comes to us through third party originators. We don't have retail on, at our site, but uh, so I deal with a lot of mortgage brokers and a lot of bankers in the state of Oregon. Uh, uh, for my own portfolio, I started investing in promissory notes back in 2014. Uh, and started my own IRA. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about at least one of those notes in one of the case studies uh, that I started with uh, way, way back uh, in that. It seems, it seems a lot longer than just six years because I think that, you know, investing in notes uh, has caused an issue with my hairline. Uh, as mentioned, I am a portfolio manager. I have a company that I'm in the process of liquidating. I think we have five or six assets still in that portfolio. Uh, and have recently made a change here this year to do something on a little bit of a higher, a higher level. Uh, and so in essence, my title, if you will, self-given title uh, is as a portfolio manager uh, for mortgage notes. Uh, hey, one thing that's real refreshing and I really want to point out here is I'm not selling anything. You know, there's no Saturday all day workshop. Uh, I don't have a home study course for anybody to look at. Uh, this is just me giving back to Bill. And uh, this is what's exciting for me is just give back a little bit uh, to folks in the note investing community uh, or those who are thinking about getting involved in it. So this is just me giving back. I don't have a thing to sell, so there's no sort of upsell at the end of this. And then hopefully, you know, I always like to put this little disclaimer because very often dealing in promissory notes could be considered a security. 
and we'll take a little bit of time and talk about that, but I'm not offering any securities, uh, no, no offer to purchase uh, any sort of securities, any sort of notes or anything. This is purely content, purely just uh, information that you can take and run with on your own. Uh, obviously, Bill knows what's going on here, and I'm always available for phone calls as, as, as well. So as we get into kind of various ways of investing in notes, I want to point out that there really are kind of just three basic type of notes to invest in. Uh, the first one is called performing notes, and these are the type of notes where the borrower is just making their regular monthly payment. And these are probably the type of notes that, you know, if you own a home and you're making your regular monthly payment, you know, that's what your note is. It's a performing note, one that you can count on for yield. You can systematically depend on their monthly payment coming in just like clockwork. Um, and then there's ones called a re-performing note. And those are a note that at one point in time, probably we're delinquent, we're in arrears at some point in time, but through efforts of the borrower, maybe the servicer or folks like Bill and myself, we were able to work with that home or homeowner, find a resolution to get them back on track, and now they've been remaking their payments for a certain period of time. Uh, we call that seasoning, and that seasoning needs to basically be about six to 12 months before we can really consider that a reperforming loan. And then the third type of loan that is available for investment is the non-performing loan. And this is the type of loan where the homeowner that owns the house, again, they're not a tenant, they actually own the house, but for some event or issue that's occurred in their life, uh, they are not making their payment. They have gone delinquent. That could be anywhere from 90 to 120 days up to 60 months. Uh, I think we've all bought notes that have been, uh, uh, you know, that long, uh, that long re-performing and, uh, you know, trying to get them back on track. I think as we enter into those type of transactions on a non-performing note, we enter into that transaction with an idea to try and help that homeowner get back on track and turn that non-performing note into a re-performing note. So the other part of it you have to decide if you're going to become invested in notes is what side of the table do you want to sit on? Do you want to be a passive investor and let your money work for you? Or do you want to be an active investor and actually get your feet dirty and your hands dirty and actually be involved, highly involved in that? And so the way to kind of describe these things is a passive investor, you know, basically has their hands off. They approach it on a hands-off basis. You know, they, they provide funding to the active participant in that, in that particular note investment. Um, they have an expectation of a, re a return, which all of us, if we're gonna invest in, you know, whatever investment vehicle you may choose, there's always an expectation of a return, uh, unless it's purely speculative. Um, but you have basically advocated your level of success to someone else. And so you're, you're hands off, you're behind the scenes for the most part, expecting return, and somebody else is, is hands-on in control of the transaction. So that's where the active investor comes in. They manages, manage all aspects of the transaction. They're the ones that are talking to the attorneys. They're the ones that are working with the servicing companies. Uh, they may also be interacting with the, uh, with the homeowners themselves, depending on what level of comfort they have in doing the collection work on that. But they're the ones that manage the day-to-day -day activities and also the major decisions on what way this loan is gonna go down. What exit strategy are we going to employ? So part of the job of the active investor right from the beginning is to find assets that you would wanna invest in. Because there's a lot of assets out there to invest in, but are they profitable? Are they going to you know, provide the return not only for yourself as the active investor, but a return for anybody else who may have invested into the transaction? So that's uh, the early part of the due diligence process, even before you own that note, is to find that desirable asset that is basically investment grade. And again, with all the activities that, that are part of that note and all the various uh, exit strategies that may come about, you know, the active investor is the one that works to main, maximize the return 
on that particular investment, comes up with the strategy uh, and the way that we go down, what path we go down, often dictated by situations that may be outside the control of the active investor, but, has, but that investor must have the knowledge and the experience in order to make that still a profitable return for all parties. And again, they're the primary person, the sole person, uh, as far as who determines or who actually has the work on what way that particular investment goes from a profit standpoint. So you have to ask yourself as you're getting into this business is what category are you? And I think that most of us have seen, you know, this uh, uh, cash flow quadrant. I think most of us in the known investment game or anything in real estate wants to make sure and put themselves on the right side of this con uh, quadrant to determine if they're a business owner or an investor. I think everybody would like to be the investor part of it, but there's, there's a, tr a progression there that you have to go through uh, in order to get to that. So the investor is the one, you're, you are an investor, you are a category of investor. Once you determine that, you know, you're looking for assets to invest in, uh, you're seeking cash flow, uh, I think most of us, and I could get on a little bit of a rant here, uh, is that uh, is that cash flow is king, that most of us pay our bills, not so much because of one lump sum profit that we get off of, say a flip, if you will. Now, I know there's a lot of flippers out there that uh, can adequately manage their money to live off cash flow off their flip profits. Uh, but cash flow is king. That's what we all have to budget for. I think from the day that we start working in, uh, you know, as an employee in our first job, uh, we are living off cash flow. We hopefully our income is greater than our outgo and than our expenses. So everything about what we do, especially as an investor, is looking for that cash flow opportunities. And we often use other people's money. Uh, there's that saying that says it takes money to make money. Well, that's true, but it doesn't take your money to make money. It oftentimes takes other people's money to make money for all people. And then there's certain tax breaks that come along with that particular investor uh, that, you know, I'm not going to talk about tax breaks per se, uh, but they are available. Now, a business owner doesn't own a job, uh, but they actually own a system. And so, you know, all the successful system, uh, businesses that you see are successful because they have a system down. You know, you could go to a McDonald's in any place in the world and you're gonna get the exact same thing that you will get in your hometown. And that's because they put a system in the place that produces predetermined amounts every time. So all of us that are business oriented need to make sure that we have a system set up that it will produce the type of results that we're looking for. Uh, the business also has specialized skills. There are things that we learn as node investors uh, along the way, plus any sort of you know, educational opportunities we take in advance that maybe the investor doesn't have, like working with the homeowner and uh, you know, making sure that you're uh, complying with the Fair Debt Collection Act and all the other specialized skills that we acquire uh, as being a node investor and businesses are notorious to be the risk takers. I think when you look at all the major companies like Elon Musk and uh, you know Steve Jobs and all the guys that have made been world changers, they're also very big risk takers. And so on whatever level that we're coming from, uh, we have a certain element of, uh, of risk that we have to take. Maybe it's a little bit of an adrenaline you know, rush because as we all know who have done anything like this, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, you never always know. There's always that question and sometimes your emotions are up and down. So it's really, really important to try and keep your emotions out of it. So some of the choices that you can make when investing in notes uh, is do it on your own. And that's how I got started. I got started by taking a self-directed IRA. And it's kind of funny, I, I had a self-directed IRA that I had set up that came out of a 401k of a previous employer. And at that particular time, I was really into coffee. Uh, and so I thought it'd be a great idea that if I used my IRA, I could buy a tax lien on a property on a coffee farm in Kona, Hawaii. So about every six months, I go to the Kona County uh, auction site to see if they have any uh, Kona coffee uh, 
plantations that are on the auction block for taxes. So that was my initial thought about using my self-directed IRA. And then as I figured out and found out what notes were all about, I decided to use that uh, self-directed IRA to invest in notes. So that's one of the choices. You can do it on your own with your self-directed IRA, or you could do it with whatever other assets that you have, uh, you know, basically cash that you have in order to invest in those. Uh, you could also enter into a joint venture side and you could be on either side of the adventure, uh, joint venture. Again, going back to the previous slide that talked about the difference between the business owner and the investor, you can invest in a joint venture uh, or you can be the business side of the a joint venture and handling the predominant side of the work. Now, I wanna take a second here and just talk about joint ventures uh, because in some instances, certain regulatory agencies will look at the joint venture to determine if a security is involved. Now, what that basically means is an actual true joint venture that will, you know, uh, not be severely scrutinized is one where both parties in the venture are bringing things to, to the venture itself. It's not a situation where one person is simply funding the transaction and the other person is doing all the work. Oftentimes, certain state regulators will do what's called a Howey test. And that's H-O-W-E-Y, a Howey test that basically determines if they are gonna look at this as a you're selling or soliciting for securities or if it truly is a adequately structured joint venture where both parties are bringing activity to the transaction. So, you know, that's another webinar, that's another conversation, but always be sure that in your joint ventures that it's structured into the point that both parties are bringing pretty much equal activity uh, into the transaction. Now, hey, Bill, the other thing is, is I'm not going to be able to see if there's any questions or chat or anything. So I'll leave that up to you if you feel like there's something I need to address during this or uh, if we can wait to the end, whatever you feel is necessary there. So I'm, t I'm, t I'm keeping an eye on that for you, Cody. All right, buddy. Appreciate it. Actually, do you want questions while you're speaking or would you rather wait till the end? It doesn't matter to me. I mean, if, we, okay. if they have a question on something we just talk about, you can bring it up right then and there. So. I do have someone wants to know uh, if you have a supplier for uh, Kona coffee. <laughs> well, uh, I have another funny story on that. We'll, we'll do that for a uh, But there's a Koa, K-O-A coffee is one of the best. In fact, I took a tour of their plantation and found out six weeks later that Forbes, Forbes named them one of the top 10 coffees in the world. So Koa coffee, do that, K-O-A. So... So collateral assignment is an interesting uh, type of structure. A collateral assignment in the experience that I've had is when I, as the business owner, borrow money from an investor and provide them with an assignment of the collateral in the event that the transaction goes sideways. So what that means is it has to be a performing note with the payments coming in on a regular basis because you're gonna make interest only payments as the business owner, you're gonna make interest only payments to the investor based on the collateral assignment and a note that you sign with them. So, so let me set this up just a little bit. I, ha I had a property that was in uh, Alabama and I borrowed money from one of my investors and I borrowed 54,500 no, 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 the other way around. I borrowed $56,000 from this particular investor. And I paid $54,500 for the note, okay? So I wrote a, a promissory note to that investor based on the $56,000 and was paying him 9% interest only on a 12-month period. So there turns out to be four profit models for me on that collateral assignment. As I mentioned, I borrowed 54.5, or I borrowed 56, but bought the note for 54.5. So that $1,500 difference, I was able to put in my pocket right away. And then my interest only payments on that note was roughly about $400. And the payments that came into me were roughly $545 a month. So I was able to pocket that $145 a month 
because that was pure profit to me. And then uh, on the back side, what I call the back side, after that 12 months, uh, I was able to sell that note for a little bit of a profit and pay off that particular investor, pay him back his 54.5. And the amount over and above that, which I was able to sell that note for, I also put in my pocket. So on the collateral assignment, again, that particular investor has a, the security for their loan is tied up in that note itself. And if that note goes sideways, that investor has the ability to just have me transfer everything over to them or have me work it out. As long as they're getting their $400 a month or their interest payments, then generally they're okay. So that's, that's, a, that's an interesting concept, a little bit high level, but it's another way to use somebody else's money to buy a note and produce a couple little profit margins for you uh, during that 12. We actually extended that out to 18 months. So I was able to get that for a full 18 months. So any questions on that, Bill? Nope, makes sense to me. It's a little bit higher level for everybody. That's yep. probably not something you're gonna start out with, but it does kind of show you some of the power and variety and versatility of notes. Yeah. So uh, loan participation is a, a little higher level as well. And I'm not done one of these myself. Uh, I've got a friend who uh, does notes out of the Phoenix area. And this is like his, his way of doing it. It's very similar to a collateral assignment. And he does draw up a promissory note with the investor to pay them a very specific interest rate that essentially gets forgiven after 12 to 18 months. And what they do, again, they purchase a performing note. And when the payment from the borrower comes in that note, the investor on that transaction gets all the principal payment to pay down his loan. Then they split the interest side on that. So whatever the principal is, goes the investor, uh, inv investor to buy down his note. And then the interest gets split 50-50 by the investor and the business owner. And so that's another way of using somebody else's money to purchase a, a note and, and then everybody profit on that. Now the collateral assignment and the loan participation are both loans. And so they're not looked at as a, uh, as a security because you're actually borrowing money. You're drawing up a promissory note of repayment uh, and they're both collateralized by the underlying asset. So uh, they're not considered or would not be looked at uh, as a security. So there's a little bit of safety in that. I like the way that those are proposed. They may not have the highest profit uh, potential, but they still work real well. And everybody talks about partials. Partials is where the business owner owns a note and they are going to sell a certain number of payments to an investor whether that be three years or five years or whatever, they're gonna sell the first, say, 60 months of that loan to the investor. The investor gets all the money during that course of that 60 payments. And then on payment 61, that reverts back to the original uh, business owner. Now, the advantage to the business owner is they know they're gonna have a note come back for some cash flow you know, on month 61 but they sell that partial to that investor at a decent yield to that investor, but now they've recapitalized to go out and buy another note. And so for, for somebody, a business owner uh, should have a portion of their portfolio knowing that you know 37 months or 61 months down the road, that note is gonna revert back to them and all the payments are gonna start coming back to them. But during that initial period that they've sold off the partial, they have that capital that they can look to reinvest. So it's kind of an interesting way of combining a couple different ways uh, to be profitable. Uh, but again, it's an opportunity on how uh, a business owner can use somebody else's money to acquire a note. And again, you can be on either side of that transaction. There's a lot of IRAs that simply want, okay, yeah, I'll invest in five years on this particular note. I'm gonna get a 12% yield. Uh, and just let the payments come to me. So they'll buy the first 60 months of a particular note, which is called a partial. You're only being, buying a partial part 
of that loan. I guess that's where they get the word partial is from part. So, and then the final way to look at uh, is basically a note fund. And uh, in a note fund, uh, the business owner has gone through the process of either uh, registering a fund with the SEC or filing the proper exemptions to registration also with the SEC uh, and also with the respective states of which their investors are. So if, if I am a, a fund manager, uh, you know, I've set up a fund, if you will, and then I'm looking for other investors who would be totally passive investors uh, who would invest in the money that allows us to purchase notes, hopefully on a larger scale, on a bulk scale, or in pools, if we call it. And then investor would have a certain anticipation of, of receiving a yield back on their investment and other opportunities that may be dictated per the fund documents. Uh, boy, now there's a lot of funds out there that require registration with the SEC and there's a lot of costs and attorneys and documents that go through that. Uh, the most uh, normal one that you might see is a Regulation A, a Reg A, or a Reg A Plus, uh, where there's a high scrutiny by the SEC and a lot of documents that go pack back and forth with the SEC and the attorney for the fund to get that approved. Uh, but it will allow investors like ourselves, perhaps, to get in with as little as $250 or $2,000 or smaller amounts like that and just pass that money off to somebody else to manage for us for a certain period of time. Now there's other funds out there that are part of the exemption side of registration. So you're not really registering a security, but you're filing a form D with the SEC that says you are exempt from certain registrations and uh, what's the right word for that? You know, certain uh, assertions with your documents. And those are called Regulation D funds. Regulation D basically comes in two levels. One is a Regulation D 506B or a 506C. Now a 506C is an exempt fund uh, that you can only allow what's called an accredited investor to invest in your fund. Uh, and just off the top of my head, an accredited investor is one who has a net worth that exceeds $1 million, excluding their primary residence, or that they've earned $250,000 a year for the past two years with an expectation of the same amount for the ongoing year, and that's individually, or I think it's $300,000 jointly. And so those are what would be called an accredited investor, and basically the ad investor CPA uh, would be able to produce a, a, a document that says I certify they're an accredited investor. And what that allows that particular business owner, the fund manager, the fund owner, if you will, to do uh, is to market and advertise for people to invest in their fund. Again, they can only be an accredited investor, but oftentimes you'll see these kind of uh, advertisements on various social media platforms. Let's say they're doing a capital raise, uh, but I'm looking for accredited investors. So that would be a Reg D 506C. Then the Reg D 506B is a little different animal because that allows for an unlimited amount of accredited investors and up to 35 non-accredited or sophisticated investors. Now a sophisticated investor is one that maybe has done some real estate investing before, uh, is pretty knowledgeable in a number of different phases of investing uh, with their money, uh, and has contains a certain knowledge, a determinable knowledge that they understand the type of investment that they're getting into. And so uh, that is, you know, oftentimes most of us that have done some investing but have not in, uh, achieved that uh, accredited standard as of yet would be considered a non-accredited or a sophisticated investor and basically be able to invest in these types of funds. The drawback to being a Reg uh, 506B is that you're not allowed to market or advertise the fund. And so that takes a, you know, some, a different type of approach to finding those investors. And typically, you have to prove, if you're asked by a state regulator or the SEC, 
that you have established a, sub, a substantive prior relationship with that particular investor. And so they, they, the, they cannot be invested in your fund without that establishing. There are certain investor questionnaires and guidelines you have to follow. Uh, and I call it the slow dance. You have to go through a little bit of a slow dance with this particular investor to get to the point that they would be eligible uh, to invest in your fund. So it's not an automatic deal. Uh, I just can't, you know, have coffee with a guy in the coffee shop and he's got $25,000 to invest in my fund. Uh, that would be something that would be frowned upon by the regulators. So, so those are, you know, oftentimes the, the primary choices. You might find other things that you can invest in, a number of different things. But for the most part, you know, those are the six items that are kind of the primary way that somebody can invest in notes. Again, pretty much on either side as the business owner who's doing all the management of, of it uh, or the investor who is supplying the financing for it or funding for it. So. So uh, that's a great place for me to pause uh, because I know that uh, Bill had talked about some case studies. We get into those at the next slide, but Bill, is there anything that I can address on any of those choices? Um, no, other than to say, uh, Cody gave a very concise, great rundown of that. Oh, and, wow. Um, I do strongly encourage everybody to look into that and it's something that um, is can be tricky and um, you know there's different SEC attorneys out there um, because what we're doing in note investing it is a little bit different than you know just owning a house and renting it out so there's um, those issues come into play a little bit more as uh, uh, note investors and like myself and Cody are aware of so uh, just to reiterate what he just told you, he gave you a lot of really good information there, but you just want to make double sure that, you know, you're on the right side of things because let's face it, no one wants to get into trouble. <laughs> no, it's not a pretty picture. It's not a pretty picture. I, and, you know, I don't look good in handcuffs. So, uh, so, okay, well, let's get into some case studies then. Uh, these are just things and these are all mine. These are all real. These all happened. Uh, kind of give you some examples of uh, a deed in lieu, DIL note I invested in with my self-directed IRA. It was one of my earliest ones. Uh, I'm going to talk about a loan mod that I had purchased, loan modification in my self-directed IRA. Uh, and then a real small balance loan mod that you're going to say, how did that work? But it worked. It was great. Uh, and then, of course, a, a joint venture example that I was involved in uh, that involved a discounted payoff. Uh, and then another joint venture example uh, that uh, was a short sale. And, and so one of the things I, I let me let me just say this too. So these five case studies, these five examples, you know, what you always hear that uh, that uh, disclaimer when they're talking about stocks and equities is, you know, past performance doesn't necessarily mean future results. So let's put that in here. And, you know, usually when you have guys like me coming on here, we're going to show you some pretty good stuff. Uh, and we're not going to talk about the ones that weren't quite like this, but let me tell you, there are ones that are not quite like this. So let's, let's be real here. You know, they all do not happen like this, but let's just be honest as well. These are things that can happen and these things did happen. So they're very much potential of what could be out there. Okay. So the first one here, this is my uh, deed and lieu on a resale. This was an ugly little house in Klamath Falls, Oregon. And this picture was taken in a February, if I recall right. Uh, it was a non-performing first lien. And again, from my perspective, I only invest in first mortgages. Uh, in my 30, almost 38 years, it's always been first mortgages. That's where I'm comfortable at. That's where I know uh, the, the laws and how they process and things. So that's what I stick within. In any of your investing things, uh, you know, stick with what you know uh, or what you have learned and educated on. Because it's uh, every time I notice that when I get outside something, try something new, uh, those are the ones that have potential to go sideways. Cody, let me pause you there just one second. So guys, I want to make sure you did understand what Cody just went over there. So Cody invests in first position notes and mortgages. Uh, that's the same as me. Um, but if any of you were on our call last month, we had Matt Adams talk about some non-performing 
second position mortgages. So that's just, you know, it's a perfectly valid way to invest. And you could argue that they're both mortgages, but it is just a different animal and you go about it a little bit differently. Everything from finding them to your due diligence to how you do the workout and all that type of thing. That's just another branch of note investing, but that's why you might, you know, hear about some differences here and might say, well, that's different than what Matt said last month. Again, Matt was talking about non non-performing second position mortgages. Tonight, Cody is talking about first position. So Cody, you weren't aware of that, but I just yeah, want- Thank to you for that. Yeah, that's a great, together. that's a great differentiating there. So, so this particular loan I bought from a hedge fund, I paid 12,500 for it. Uh, again, in a little community called Klamath Falls, uh, Oregon. Uh, there are no falls there, but they still call it that. Uh, this borrower out of California bought this as a second home, and I am quite certain that this person never saw this house. And so this person borrowed $95,000 to acquire this house, and I think it, uh, the purchase price on this was about one hundred five, if I recall right at the time. Uh, as you can see, we've got some, uh, we had put some brand new windows on it. Uh, when I purchased the loan, it was five years delinquent. And so the particular hedge fund that owned it really did no pursuit whatsoever in trying to get this resolved or foreclosed or whatever. Uh, and, and then the house was in fairly rough shape. Uh, so once we bought it, I started going down the path of trying to contact the homeowner just to see if they would deed it back over to me, as in the deed of Lou. Deed and Lou. It took five months to chase this person down in Southern California. And, and a couple of interesting things there. In the state of Oregon, as in most states, uh, there is, uh, uh, when, when you foreclose on a house and your proceeds on the house are much less than what that asset principal balance was, that difference between the balance that was owed and the dis difference that you sold it at as a, as a mortgage company is called a deficiency. And you can sue for a deficiency judgment, which basically means that once you sell that house, there is a judgment against that homeowner for the difference that attaches to their credit report on the hopes that somewhere down the line as they apply for more credit, this judgment shows up and at least then you can no negotiate the payoff of that, of that judgment. Now, that doesn't happen. It's not allowable on a home where the original loan was purchased for occupancy, an owner-occupied purchase transaction. But because this home was bought as a second home, I did have the right to pursue a deficiency judgment. But part of what I did is I used that little hook to tell that homeowner that I would waive my right to a deficiency judgment if, if, if this person signed the deed and new documentation. And they did. So once I got that signed, I got it listed with a local agent down there. Uh, I sold the house for $27,500. Three days after it was listed, I accepted an offer from a local investor down there. And I returned 103.818% in my IRA uh, by holding that thing for, I think it was eight months total that I, that I held that. So uh, that was a nice win, win, win. The homeowner won because they didn't have to worry about this house anymore without a threat of, uh, of any sort of deficiency. Uh, the investor uh, who fixed this house up, put a new family in it. Everybody's a winner there. And obviously my IRA was a winner as well. So, so that was Cody, I just want to interrupt there for just a second. So sure. up at the top, uh, Cody mentioned what the letters D-I-L stand for. That stands for deed in lieu. So um, some folks that are, might be joining us tonight that aren't familiar with that, what that means is uh, Cody bought the non-performing note. So this person had stopped paying on that mortgage. So he bought the mortgage. He talked to the um, borrower and he said, hey, if you just sign this house over to me, okay? So he's signing the deed over to Cody. So Cody will now own the house. And in return, Cody just says, you just sign it over to me free and clear. And basically all this gets cleared up and you won't have to pay any more money. You won't have any more hassle from this at all. And that is what's known as a deed in lieu. 
So that's different than going through a whole foreclosure process where he has to possibly go to court and then um, the judge has to actually uh, take it through that. Um, that's a way to kind of avoid all that. It's really nice that he was able to do this because that way he saves an awful lot of time and he can and money. solve this it's... a lot quicker. It saves a lot of time and money. Yeah. So, but I wanted yeah. to make sure everybody understood what a deed in lieu was. Yeah, it's a deed in lieu of foreclosure. So I didn't have to go down the foreclosure path and, you know, uh, expend all those uh, costs associated with the court foreclosure. So. Okay, the, the next one here is a little loan modification I did on a nice little property in Detroit. And you'll see a lot of these are coming from Detroit. Again, it was a non-performing first lien. Uh, the balance owing on the house uh, when I purchased the note was just over 50500 uh, And you can see it was valued was at thirty five a thousand. So this house was upside down. And you ask yourself, why would you uh, buy a note where the value was less than the amount that was owed. Well, in this situation, the original borrower had passed away and it deeded the house to the niece who was living in the house. And this was the nicest house on this whole block. Uh, and the modification that was in place was all, well, the modification was already in place. So I knew what the terms of the new loan mod was before I purchased this particular note. Now I paid $19,500 for this note. Uh, and so you can see I placed my purchase price off the lesser of the value or the unpaid principal balance. And so I paid, you know, under $20,000 for this particular note. And uh, the principal and interest payment on that modified loan was just under $335,000 on a monthly basis. You know, nice little cash flow. Again, they own the home. I'm the mortgage company, so I don't have to deal with tenants or rental agreements or any of that sort of stuff. Uh, I funded this basically half-half with another investor, both of us in our self-directed IRAs, and each one of us are getting just over 13% return on investment on this particular asset. So, cute little Cody, house. If could, Cody, if I could interrupt just one second here. Sure. So, uh, these first couple deals Cody has talked about with his self-directed IRA, um, just to make sure people are aware there's some particular rules and ways you have to do things with that. And um, to learn a lot more about that, I highly recommend uh, Hubert Bruce's uh, uh, self-directed uh, IRA investing group, uh, also through Cori here. So little plug for Hubert. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. Uh, and I just got a picture from this homeowner here. <coughs> Last week, <clears throat> she's putting a new roof on the house. <clears throat> so not a bad deal. <clears throat> Cody, we do have a question about that. Um, yeah. Uh, somebody said uh, that's a good buy. Um, what year was this purchased? Uh, the spread seems tight these days. Well, uh, this, this uh, note is still going on. It's still being played. I'm still getting the monthly payments for this one here. So I've not liquidated this out. I think that this one here has been going on for two and a half years at this point. So, so here's a small balance loan modification. This was a fun little one. This is the one you're gonna go scratch your head just a little bit, okay? So this one is the first mortgage. It was modified just prior to my purchase. Again, I bought this all by myself in my, one of my self-directed IRAs. Uh, and in the modification, they said a new principal balance, your new loan is modified to a flat, even $18,000. Again, this is a nice little house uh, in, in Detroit. And part of that modification is you're gonna make 12 payments of just a little over $1,500 a month at a 7% interest rate. And then the loan would mature, it would be paid off. So it was a one year amortizing loan, paying off $18,000 at just over $1,500 a month for 7% interest rate. Uh, the value on the house was at $33,000. So again, it's a, it's a low value type of house, uh, but this homeowner, uh, went through all the process to go through the modification. 
Uh, I paid 80000 or $8,800 for this particular note. So you can see I made $10,000 in a 12-month period, and I think if the, my numbers are correct, that's about 111% in that 12-month period. So the, these things are, you know, again, it's still a little bit tight out there, on, especially on the non-performing stuff, uh, but they're available if, if you have the right, uh, you know, opportunities to, to find the right sellers on this one. Can you go back uh, this to that one, one for just a second, please, Cody? Sure. I want to uh, just slow down a little bit and um, just kind of make sure everybody understood uh, this one then and just see if anybody has any questions about this. So the, the, to me, the, that 111%, that looks like three rocket ships going up toward the sky. <laughs> well, you know, cool. Bill, when I saw this one on the tape that I was looking at, and I mean, I ran these numbers, I don't know, a dozen times to go, if, if I pay 8850 for this thing here, and they're gonna pay me back $18,000 and the loan's paid off in 12 months, it, is there something I'm missing here? And I mean, this one here, I kind of agonized over, is there something I'm missing, something I'm missing? So I went through all the due diligence and you know, pulled the trigger at 88.5. And that was, uh, and then May the following year, uh, we paid it off. He paid it off. It was the final payment. Uh, we executed the satisfaction of mortgage and boom, this guy now owns his house free and clear. And I put an extra 10 grand in my self-directed IRA over a 12 month period. Yep. So, that's great, Cody. Um, yeah, it's fun. Griff, Griffith had a question here. Uh, what is UPB? Um, and then he kind of figured it out. Unpaid balance. Yes, that is exactly what UPB is, is unpaid balance. And, you know, just, and it, just from an uh, education perspective, yeah. um, I want to tell everyone, you know, if you do have a, a non-performing note, just be really careful. They might sometimes also say total balance owed. And the UPB is what you know for sure that you will be getting back. Sometimes the total uh, um, amount owed Depending on the state, sometimes you might get all of that total balance back, sometimes you might not. So I encourage everybody to just be aware of that and be a little bit conservative and uh, try to make your bids, just like Cody said, based on either the lower number of the unpaid balance, the UPB, or the value of the house. So. Yeah, we call that uh, that total amount owed over and above the UPB, we call that gravy. <laughs> when you get it, that gravy tastes good, but you don't it's always get it. And, and I like gravy. So this uh, is a joint Cody, venture that I entered into Cody, with a local just, investor. Cody, What's just, that? Cody, just one second. Uh, yeah. We did have one other question here. I'll see what Cody says about this and then if I have anything to add. Um, Kiera, hopefully I said your name correctly. Uh, Kiera asked, uh, how do you usually find notes to purchase? Well, that, that's, a great, uh, that's a great question. And, and that's probably a, a webinar all by itself. But, you know, you develop relationships through a number of different places. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on LinkedIn uh, looking for portfolio managers or fund managers or uh, secondary marketing managers and, and, and or hedge funds. I mean, like this one here was purchased from a hedge fund as well. Uh, they're not as plentiful as they were, you know, just a few years ago. Uh, but there's a number of different ways. And, and, and that really is, is a, a really good question that can develop is that, you know, we talked about these kind of notes, but then there's a lot of different kind of promissory notes that you can go after. You know, my basic model has me going after institutionally originated promissory notes and mortgages or deeds of trust. But there's a lot of folks now that are focusing on notes that are seller financed or seller carry notes, where somebody purchased a piece of prop or sold a piece of property and decided to carry the financing to that purchaser. And oftentimes, if you catch that note holder at the right moment, they would be willing to sell that note to somebody at a discount because they have something going on in their life that requires that cash. And so that's another avenue. There's, I know a lot of people that are marketing for seller finance notes. You could contact one of your local title insurance companies who can do a farm, a title insurance farm 
in the area that you want to target for seller finance notes that were recorded within you know a certain time frame so i mean there's a number of different things on way to find notes and and again you as you're structuring your business model you'll need to ask yourself what type of note am i looking for am i looking for the non-performing first mortgages am i looking for a non-performing second should those be institutionally originated seconds or am i looking for when mom and pop sold their house uh, and they carried the paper on that or provided the seller financing on that. Is that the type of loan I want to go after? So there's a number of different things that, you know, by more education, look at the, the number of podcasts that are out there. There's a number of podcasts uh, that you can find for people in the note is industry that talk about this all the time. Uh, and just some, you know, some educational classes and obviously keep up with what Bill's doing and what this particular uh, webinar uh, does on a monthly basis because I think Bill brings in some pretty high quality folks uh, that talks about uh, how they invest in notes and it gives you an idea. But a lot of it like any business is is you have to structure it with that system like we talked about it earlier. When I was the president of Northwest RIA part of my job was to bring in you know outside speakers nationally known speakers uh, uh, who, who would come into our RIA and generally do a Thursday night, 90 minute presentation, then an all day Saturday thing and tried to sell a boot camp or tried to sell a, a, a home study course uh, or things such as that. Uh, but I always told every one of my folks before these meetings is, is, you know, you've got a model, you've got a business model and it should be in writing. And as these people come in, uh, and give their particular presentation, you have to ascertain, ascertain, is this something that is part of my already established model or not? And if it is, or even partially is, what can I pull from them that will help me with my own business? So, so that's the thing you have to think about as you're setting up your business. What really turns you on? Hopefully it's promissory notes uh, and all the advantages that Bill and I see in investing in notes. Uh, so hopefully that's something that uh, that you guys will get out of this and all the subsequent webinars that Bill hosts. So, so just to piggyback on what Cody said, I agree with him 100%. That is a uh, <laughs> where to find notes is a uh, question and a subject that is talked about quite a bit, and um, I agree with everything Cody said. Probably for the most part networking is almost always going to be your very best bet. The yep. more people you know, the better. Um, you can contact banks, you can contact hedge funds. Um, there are sometimes uh, online uh, websites you can go to buy notes. Uh, just keep in mind, the easier it is to find the note, um, you might make a little bit less on the deal. You know, you think about it. Uh, if you're looking for, you know, a rental uh, investment house, you know, you might be able to find one like on the basic MLS along with all the other houses, but um, it's good. It might be tough to find one there. It's like uh, the needle in the haystack, so to speak. You might find one once in a while, but it'll, it'll be tough to find good rentals on there on a consistent basis. Um, and then, like you said, seller financing, that's a whole nother route you can go through. Um, and there's advantages and disadvantages to both. I mean, the institutional paper, like Cody talks about, that's probably, probably, not always, a high quality note. Um, it's gone through certain underwriter um, standards and that type of thing versus a lot of times seller financing notes they, that can just run the whole gamut. You know, I've um, talked with people that, you know, took a look at this seller financing note that someone did and it was just written horribly and, um, uh, but they're paying. So it might still be a decent investment. Um, Donna Bauer teaches a lot of things about how to change uh, a seller financing note in order to make sure it's legal and all that. Um, so you might uh, check out some of her materials um, uh, for more information about that. And uh, like I said, that would do it. I personally, I made a uh, presentation, I think it was sometime in uh, 19, about um, 
how to find notes. And um, I can repeat that for everybody because that is a question that uh, I have been getting, you know, again, more and more through the uh, uh, course of doing these webinars and such. So uh, hopefully that answers your question and you can get with me if uh, you have, uh, if you want to talk more about that at another time. Awesome. And then, uh, uh, Cody Hubert asked a question here. What do you look for in a hedge fund uh, you are working with? Well, one of the main things is uh, accessible to information. Uh, you know, and when you're looking at due diligence, you know, there's kind of two phases to due diligence. Uh, the first phase is, is the, what I call the upfront due diligence, where you get a tape, you're analyzing the information on the tape. Uh, and you're looking at various reports that you're not spending any money on to try and come up with what we call an indicative bid. And so you, you've determined that if everything checks out on this particular note, uh, I'm willing to purchase it at this price and you submit an indicative bid back to that hedge fund. And if they accept your bid, uh, or maybe there's a little negotiation on that, the next step would be final due diligence and the big part of that is, is basically being able, there's a number of parts to that, but one of the big parts is, is looking into what's called the collateral file. Because when you think about buying notes, you're not buying a, a piece of property per se, it's the security for the paper you're buying. You're buying a file. And so you wanna make sure that that file contains all the pertinent parts of the life history of that loan and with an eye that if this loan goes sour and I may need to foreclose, the courts are gonna require a proper chain of title to show that I truly do own this loan to execute a foreclosure. And so the answer to that question is, is, is that collateral file is what you're really purchasing. So that hedge, hedge fund <clears throat> needs to be able to provide to me a very complete and concise collateral file uh, and so a lot of that becomes reputation. Um, there are hedge funds out there that I bought loans from that you can't get the right stuff out of. Uh, and for whatever reason, I bought it anyway. Uh, but for the most part, especially when you're using third party funding, another person's money, you don't want to take that kind of risk that there may be some endorsement to the note from 2014 that is lost. And that there could impair your ability to foreclose on that house. So, so that's kind of what I look for in hedge funds or any sellers is the access to the information and the willingness to share it uh, and the completeness of what you do get. So, you know, that's, that's, I guess I look at it that way is, is am I going to be able to, uh, you know, get a good enough look at it to make a qualified uh, decision on the purchase? Hopefully that answered the question. And just along those lines, guys, there is uh, sometimes a wide disparity in one hedge fund to another. Some will be very um, happy to share information. They'll give you whatever they have. And others, it's, uh, uh, it's like pulling teeth. <laughs> yes, it is. All, All right. right. Go on, to the, next on one. to the next one. I've got uh, just a few more slides and then we can, I see we're coming on. We just uh, passed one hour. So, so this is another joint venture that I was involved in that involved a discounted payoff. It was a non-performing loan when we purchased the, purchased the note. Uh, the house was valued at $110,000. Uh, this one was also uh, in a nice area of Detroit. Uh, the amount of UPB was just over $76,000. And as Bill alluded to a, a few minutes ago, the total amount due to on this note was $121,000, which basically says that this particular not made, person had not made payment for quite a while. And so there was a lot of past payments and interest that accrued that were legally part of what she owed on the note uh, that was still outstanding. But again, I based my acquisition off the lower of value or the unpaid principal balance, the UPB. Uh, I paid $38,500 for this note. Uh, this loan had been uh, sold to two previous uh, investors uh, and they couldn't get anything out of it. This particular homeowner uh, had her original loan with one of the big five and she got a letter that said that the big five were required by the US government uh, to either forgive or provide opportunity for this homeowner to get back on track. 
Uh, she read it as that her loan was forgiven. Uh, it took me about a month to prove to her that your loan was not forgiven, that you really did owe this money. Uh, but once we were once we were able to give that uh, uh, convince her that she still owed this money, we gave her three options to resolve her transaction. Uh, one was the deed in lieu. Uh, another, a second one was to modify the loan, uh, and the third one was basically uh, if you pay me off all at a, at this particular amount, uh, we'll just call her either and uh, give her a discounted payoff. That's what she chose. Uh, I accepted a payoff for $67,500. Again, I paid $38,500 for this note. Uh, this one I bought in at January and sold in May. And so that annualized that return just to the investor of 75% uh, for the five months that we held this note. So uh, when you purchase your note at discounts like this, that gives you some flexibilities to offering various discounted payoffs, modification terms, a number of different things like that. Uh, because you now own the note, you have the legal right to make those kind of adjustments or modifications as they will be. So, Does anyone have final questions on this, uh, this example, on this case study? Yeah. All right. So... Paul is asking, uh, he just wants to go again, Cody. I think he's correct here. So your three options were a DIL, a deed in lieu, like we correct. talked about. That's what happens when the borrower just signs the house over to Cody. Yep. A loan modification. You could think of that as uh, changing the terms of the note. Since Cody is the note holder, he's the borrower, he's acting as the bank. That means at Cody's discretion, he can change almost anything he wants as long as the borrower agrees. He can change the interest rate. He could change the principal amount owed. He could change the amount of um, uh, that had already been owed and say was uh, you know uh, overdue uh, fees and um, what we call uh, arrears. Um, so he has the power to call mo what's called modify the loan. Uh, and then the last uh, option uh, he's got on here were a discounted payoff. And uh, with a discounted payoff, that's you could basically consider that a short sale. And uh, what that would mean is if somehow they were able to just come up with a lump sum of money, um, Cody could uh, choose to accept that also. Um, I'd have to look at the numbers here. You said the purchase price was 38.5. So what if, I don't know, what if they managed to get their hands on $60,000 and they came up and they said, hey, Cody, I've got $60,000 here. Will you just take this and um, I'll just own the house free and clear. Then it's up to Cody, okay? He might just accept it and say, hey, you know, I paid 38.5, he's offering me 60. He's got the cash, no muss, no fuss. I'll just take the 60 and go on about my way. Or he might decide, you know, well, wait a minute, I'm owed 76. If I just hold out and go through this, then, you know, maybe I'll end up with more. And that's when you start to weigh, you know, how much more hassle is it going to be to go after this 76 here? And how long is that going to take me? If it might take you another year, then you might just say, well, that's too much hassle. I'm just gonna take the 60 and call it a day. So. Yeah, so you, you, you ask yourself, okay, they really owe me $121,000. Why would I accept a $60,000 payoff or a $67,000 discounted payoff? And it goes back to another webinar that Bill's gonna have called uh, Acceleration of Capital. Uh, and, and so one of those kind of things, how quick you get the money back to reinvest again uh, would be uh, something that uh, that uh, is an interesting computation when you're looking at these things. And so, you know, uh, the speed of the money, the return of the money, uh, various ways to call that. But uh, the acceleration of capital uh, is is a, a very strong proponent for accepting discounts as long as they're reasonable. I mean, they came back to me and said forty thousand dollars. You know, no, because I paid thirty eight five for the note. And the value, of course, is a consideration is in, is in there as well. So uh, 
you know, oh, velocity of capital was the actual word I was looking for, velocity of capital. So, you know, those are all the kind of the things that you kind of throw into your calculator to find out how that's going to work. And uh, yeah, I kind of think a 75% return back to the investor was a pretty good number. So. Yeah. yeah, I think that's pretty good. Darn good yeah. for a passive return there. Yeah. Uh, so. Cody, Allen asked here, what were your administrative, uh, administrative costs on that transaction? Well, uh, I, we set it up obviously with the servicer. Uh, everything we do, we set up with the servicer right away. Uh, I did most of the work, oh, I did all the work out. So I never really got to a point where I had any attorney fees on this one here. Uh, we, we went through the process of uh, drawing up a payoff. Uh, we routed it through escrow because I wanted to make sure that she just wasn't sending me a check. Uh, she took it into an escrow company there, and and so there was some uh, there wasn't any title insurance per se, but there was some minor escrow fees. So the fees on this particular one, there was also some final recording costs when you had to you have to record a satisfaction of mortgage and a number of things like that. Uh, but I think my costs on this thing here were less than two thousand dollars overall. So that's pretty good, guys. Yeah. Um, Cody Doug asked. So to clarify, are you saying that there was $45,000 in late payments and accrued interest that had been added onto the UPB of 76,000? That is correct. This lady again thought that her loan was forgiven. And so she just ignored everything that came to her from whoever the investor or the owner of the note was. She thought she was part of that uh, federal settlement uh, with who was it? It was Bank of America, Wells Fargo, GMAC. Uh, there was, I think, four or five of those large lenders that were part of that agreement. Part of the agreement was that they were going to forgive certain loans, uh, but the major part of it was that they were going to provide homeowners an opportunity to modify and get back on track. She thought that, whoo, my loan was forgiven. And then when she pulled her credit report, it showed the word discharge on it. Well, it was discharged because that particular lender felt that the loan was uncollectible, but that didn't mean that it canceled out the note. And so that was part of the discussion I had to have with her about what all these terms mean. And so, yeah, this one, I, uh, this one here had a little bit more sweat equity into it than maybe it was dollars. So. Okay. Um, Paul made the observation here. A dollar today is better than a dollar tomorrow. Very often, you're right. Very often, not <laughs> yes, all the sir. time, but very often. And then uh, John uh, asked here, uh, Cody, were you concerned she might do bankruptcy? That's always a concern every time. But the thing about this particular house is that, you know, she, she had a lot of emotional attachment to this house. That's one of the things you get to engage in. And she raised her only son as a single mother in this house. And so there was emotional attachment to that. And, and so that was something you keep in your head that, you know, how can we make this? Because this is this lady's home. I mean, behind all the numbers, there's still a human being back there. And so this was this lady's home. And so I, I felt I had a lot of flexibility that I can help her retain that home. That's why we get into it. Uh, and, and so... Yeah, there's always the threat of bankruptcy, but still in a bankruptcy situation, the investor is going to typically end up getting that house one way or the other, or if they went through a chapter 13 and the trustee mandated a certain type of payment, then, you know, we'd start getting that, you know, through a trustee initiated payment plan. Uh, so from, from, a, from a mortgage lien holders perspective, bankruptcies are not that scary. Okay because you still, that doesn't erase your lien. Now it could on a second mortgage, there could be some equity stripping on a second mortgage, but it does not happen on a first mortgage. And then Hubert asked, is the discounted payoff similar to the technique Matt discussed? Uh, I believe that was one of Matt's uh, case studies where he talked about, um, uh, he just accepted um, less than the total amount owed Again, just to get, you know, a lot of cash up front and he made a profit just getting what the borrower had offered. So similar to what Cody just said, yeah, you know, he, it was a reasonable profit that he was happy with and the homeowner had and you don't have to, you know, continue to kind of fight and uh, go back and forth about it. So kind of what uh, 
Paul said just two lines above there. Uh, I think Matt's example was like that. A dollar today is better than a dollar tomorrow. A dollar you know you have today is better than a dollar you might get tomorrow. Exactly, <laughs> especially. So. so this is a little, uh, little house in North Las Vegas, Nevada. And in fact, the homeowner on this one here called it a little shack. Asked me, why would I want to foreclose on this little shack? Uh, again, it was a non-performing first lien. Uh, the value was a pretty solid $80,000. I had a number of different evaluations that showed at it $80,000. Uh, the UPB was uh, 76 nine and uh, the total they owned was 143. <clears throat> uh, this particular homeowner uh, lost his wife. And when he lost his wife, he just kind of gave up, didn't make another payment uh, and just sat in his house. Uh, by himself for the most part. He had a, a daughter that lived with him with a couple children, which was not helping financially in, in the house at all. Uh, he had a son that was recently released from state prison who wasn't uh, able to get a job. So all sorts of stories that you will find about folks who, you know, there's an event that creates a situation. So this one here, uh, I paid 43.7 for this house, for this note. And uh, tried to work with this particular homeowner. He wasn't doing anything from trying to, you know, do anything at all. He was just basically had given up. And so we started foreclosure process in the state of Nevada, but the state of Nevada legislation, which is a trustee state, a trust deed state, uh, they, they passed some legislation that had to do with the mediation process. And a lot of our states have, you know, if you're going to foreclose and you're at certain levels of foreclosures in this state, you have to go through a mediation process with that homeowner to see if there's a way to keep them in the house. Uh, in this situation, the legislature passed the mediation, but then as in most legislation that gets passed into law, the particular agency that manages the mediation process or, the, or any of those uh, new laws have to write the rules on how they implement them. So we got hung up for about, what was it, four months why the particular agency in the state of Nevada was writing their mediation processes before we could actually move forward on filing the foreclosure. So we sat for four months doing nothing. And then out of the blue, I get a call from my attorney in the morning and says, okay, the rules are written, we can proceed. But then later on, I get a call from my servicing company and says, we just received a short sale request for $80,000. And so what's a guy to do? I accepted the short sale request. They wanted me <clears throat> as the lender to pay a huge amount of costs, relocation costs for this homeowner. Uh, I countered back to them and says, I'm not paying that, I would pay this. I think I ended up paying $2,100 as a cash for keys kind of situation. Uh, but I returned 33 and a third percent to the investor on this transaction on this little dingbat house in North Las Vegas, Nevada. So as you can see, there's all sorts of, and this is one of the reasons I think why Bill and I are really attracted to uh, notes is that there's multiple exit strategies. There's a number of ways to li liquidate one of these. Mo many of them could be just buy and hold. You buy a performing note, you put it in your IRA or whatever you're doing and just let it make payments for you. You get an option on how you could liquidate that if you want to. Whereas if you're a flipping a house and you borrow hard money to acquire that house and enough money to do the rehab to it, you're really kind of stuck with one exit strategy and that is to resell that house. And we're kind of in a market where, you know, values are tentative. We, we hopefully they'll continue to go up. There's pockets that are going to continue to be real strong, but there's also pockets that won't. And so if you can't sell a house that you've got hard money on, generally it's not going to cash flow uh, with whatever rent you can put in there. So to me, that, that's kind of a kind of backs you into a corner of what kind of exit strategy you have with flipping houses. You know, the other thing I see is, is there's, you know, probably, you know, over a million people across the country that are flipping houses or wholesaling houses. And I would say there's probably less than 5,000 5, people across the country that are working in notes. So 
Does anybody have uh, other questions about yep. this one? So this is a good example of a, uh, uh, oh, go back maybe to that one, just one second, Cody, if you would. Yep. Um, this is a good example here of a, another uh, short sale here. So, um, you know, this one ended up working out obviously pretty well. Does everyone understand kind of how this one happened and went down or have any questions about it? Again, don't keep it too, too, don't make it too, too complicated. He ended up, you know, in the, when all is said and done, he paid uh, just uh, under 44000 for the note and, you know, ended up getting $80,000. So that's pretty darn good. Uh, Cody, you have, uh, you've gained a cheerleader. <laughs> Who's that? Carl Royer uh, just uh, praised you. Uh, beautiful job of pre presenting the basics with some complications explained. Yeah. Count me Carl's, as a Carl's a great guy. Carl's an awesome guy. So I know Carl personally. Um, Cody, we do have a couple of other questions now. Sure. Um, see what your thoughts on this question are. Uh, Bill Summit is asking, are there any U.S. states to stay away from or Canada? Uh, well, I, I only deal in the United States, of course. There are some states that I do avoid, and there, there's typically two reasons for that. Uh, I, I, I avoid New York, New Jersey, and Illinois uh, because it just takes too long. If you have to foreclose, it just takes forever. And that's not a wise use of money when there's other assets out there. Uh, Illinois uh, is an incredibly consumer-friendly state, and, and I'm okay because I'm a consumer too, but as an investor, uh, when they do things very deliberately, it seems, not only Cook County or Crook County as some of us call it, uh, but when they do things deliberately to slow the pace down, it just becomes more trouble than it's worth. Uh, and it, all that does is erode into your return. So I, I stay away from New York, New Jersey, and Illinois. Uh, there's a variety of other states that have certain licensing requirements. And as in my, my next uh, evolution of what we're going through here, we will eventually get into those uh, licensed states. Uh, Georgia, uh, Ohio has come up with some interesting stuff. Uh, actually, where I'm at, the state of Oregon and state of Washington require some licensing before you can buy notes. Uh, they basically want you to be licensed as a debt collector. Uh, even if I put these into a... Uh, loan servicing company to service the debt for me, which I do on every one that we purchase, uh, they still require that the owner of the note be licensed as a debt collector and, you know, certain bonding and things such as that. So uh, those are states uh, that I do stay away from. Georgia is one of those, but there's great assets in Georgia. So that would be the first one that I would probably target as far as getting licensed and registered there. Uh, I do a lot in Michigan, as you can tell here. I like Indiana. I like Missouri. Uh, I like the Carolinas, uh, I like Alabama, uh, uh, Florida, Florida is pretty popular, Texas is pretty popular, uh, and uh, Louisiana has got some assets in there as well. You just have, you know, again, it comes down to the model that you feel, you know, somebody, I, I guess what I would suggest if you want to get in the notes, the first thing you should do is maybe buy one that is a performing note, just so you can understand the mechanics. Place it with a servicer, get that all set up, have that mailbox money come to you every month, just like clockwork, uh, and get the feel for to, what it's like to be on the other side of the table. You know, I've got this uh, advantage. I've been doing this essentially in one form or another for thir almost 38 years. So I might be, you know, uniquely positioned to understand this rather than somebody that, you know, just maybe got out of a mastermind and they haven't bought their first note yet. So I, I understand that. And, and that's why I put my contact information out there. Again, I don't have anything to sell. You know, I, I don't want to be a mentor per se, but I sure will answer questions because I didn't know boss tell me years ago that all boats rise with the tide. So if Doug's doing great buying notes because I've helped him a little bit, then I know I'm buying notes and doing real well and on and on and on. So, so those things all work out to all of our favor uh, as we're giving back to this note community. Uh, there's, a, there's a phrase that, that Bill has 
pretty well familiar with the word that we're kind of in cooperation with each other. Uh, you know, we cooperate, but we have a little bit of competition because oftentimes we're looking maybe at the same assets, but that's not a problem because Bill has a certain target asset that he's looking for, which is different than the target asset that I may be looking for. And rarely do I trip over another node investor, you know, that, that I'm working with or, or in cooperation with. So, you know, I, I, I kind of like that aspect of it. That's when we go networking, we all go to these conferences and, and, you know, just, just know everybody and have a great time with everybody. But, you know, then we go up to our hotel room and try and underbid everybody. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a fun, a fun little uh, game that we play. Uh, but I like it. Uh, Bill Summit, uh, one or two other things. Um, I don't, I agree with everything Cody said. And um, just uh, one other thought is you just want to try to understand whatever nuances there are about the states that you're looking at. Um, for example, uh, Michigan is a faster foreclosure. That's a good thing. Uh, however, Michigan also has a redemption period which means um, if you do end up getting the house back, uh, I believe theirs is six months. That's right. I, okay. Yeah. Um, so for six months, you might not be able to do anything with the house. So you have to kind of weigh these factors and really try to see, you know, like Cody just said, what is your model? What are you trying to accomplish? What are you comfortable with? Um, even though I do concur with what he said, I don't think I would ever buy in one of those three states that Cody just mentioned, uh, New York or New Jersey or Illinois. Someone buys notes in those states. And, um, you know, you just kind of have to take that into account. And when you make your bid that, okay, if this really goes bad and I need to foreclose, it might take two or three years. But if you bought it at such a low dollar figure, that still might make sense. You just have to know that ahead of time and take that into account. And that's when um, just doing your homework comes into play there and just trying to kind of know what you're doing. Um, and then you asked about Canada. Um, there's a couple of uh, note investors that uh, live in Canada. Chad uh, Erbshot is a uh, friend of mine. He lives in Canada. And um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on their names. There's one or two others. Um, but the, there's a couple that do live in Canada. Uh, Alan, yeah, Cody um, is a very uh, highly experienced investor. Uh, you can uh, get with him um, to talk more about uh, possible opportunities. Uh, and then Bill Summit also asked about a Kentucky license and then Ohio. Um, Cody, you might know, I believe Code Kentucky wants you to have a, a surety bond if you bid on any notes in Kentucky. I've never bid on any in Kentucky, but I yeah, believe- That is correct. They, they, they have a certain li a licensing level in Kentucky, so I stay out of Kentucky. Yeah. Ohio had some legislation about a year and a half ago that says that by, if you want to buy a note in there, you have to be licensed as a loan servicing company. Even if you're going to give it to another loan servicer to manage it, you still have to be licensed as a loan servicing uh, and have a valid NMLS license, National Mortgage Licensing System, NMLS license uh, as a loan servicer for three years. And so they've made it very, very hard. Uh, you know, I've still got some assets in my prior, in my previous portfolio uh, that are in Ohio. Uh, and so I just need to get out of those as soon as I can before they come knocking. And uh, for everybody, I am writing my name and phone number in the uh, chat here. Um, and uh, I'll write my email here also because uh, there's more and more names on here that I'm not familiar with. So. <laughs> so that is my uh, name and phone number and, uh, and email address there. Uh, Cody had his up on the board a few minutes ago. Um, any other questions from anybody tonight? Going once.
Hey, Bill, hit, hit enter again. It doesn't look like your name and information, contact oh. information popped up, at least not on my screen. I, I sent it individually to one person. I apologize, everybody. And then, Cody, uh, could you put the screen with your uh, contact information back up there, Cody? Yep. Did that do it? Yes, it's up now. Thank you. All right, perfect. Well, once again, Bill, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk with your group here. And uh, thanks to the guys that, uh, you know, around the local area here in the Portland area who've uh, participated in this. Uh, you know, this is always kind of fun for me. Uh, and uh, getting an opportunity just to kind of talk about notes is always fun. So uh, I encourage you, if you guys have any questions, to email me, give me a phone call, and uh, we'll talk notes. Thank you so, so much uh, for joining us tonight, Cody. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can uh, get with Cody or myself. Um, also, Hubert has, uh, did just mention in here about his uh, tax-free investing group. Again, it's a great, uh, another great opportunity for co-REM members. And um, next month, uh, tentative plans are right now for Donna Bauer uh, to be joining us on this uh, monthly meeting. And um, for those of most people uh, have heard of her, at least uh, she's a nationally known speaker um, on notes. And uh, I, she's my friend and uh, one of my friends and mentors. And uh, I feel very blessed uh, she's willing to come on here. But uh, Cody, you knocked the ball out of the uh, out of the ballpark oh. today. So uh, really appreciate it. And, yeah, guys. Um, just, uh, I'm really glad everybody could join us tonight, and I hope everybody is uh, safe out there, and um, happy note investing. All right, sounds good. Thank you guys very much. All right, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye now.